Okay, I'm going to show you how Maxwell's equations show that there is such a thing as an electromagnetic wave. So we have to really start with two parts here, uh, and there's a whole bunch of background stuff, uh, and I'll put the links to everything that's relevant to this down below. But number one, uh, what is the wave equation? So suppose I have a string, uh, and it's, a, it's stretched in the, actually that's x, in the x direction, uh, and I displace it and I let it go, or, or I have some form when I let it evolve in time. It turns out that uh, each position on this moves up and down, uh, and we can describe the solution to that uh, with the wave equation. And I've, I've derived that numerically, uh, but I'm not going to derive that here, but I'll tell you what it says. It says that this function of x and t, this is an x in the x direction, a one-dimensional thing, one-dimensional string, right? The, the wave is in the, in the f direction. The second partial of that function with respect to time is equal to the velocity of the wave, and, and this is how, how this is this velocity. The velocity squared times the second partial with respect to space, and that is the wave equation in one dimension. Super important. Super, super useful. Okay. Now, if you uh, have, it's possible to do this in three dimensions with some vector field, say so you have some vector field f, uh, then I still have the second partial with respect to time of the vector field, and then I still have the velocity. But here I have the Laplacian. So the Laplacian is really just, uh, this is really just equal to the del operator uh, dotted itself, where I guess I didn't write down the del operator, but that's fine. We'll get to that later. I got, I got a thing on that later. So this is, this is the three-dimensional version of that. Okay, so that's the wave equation. Now let's go over here to Maxwell's equations. So these are the integral form of Maxwell's equations. Let me just say what they are. So this says, this is Gauss's law. I, I guess I should put a, maybe if I put a box around it, it'll make it more impressive in purple. So Gauss's law says that uh, if I have the electric flux through some surface, that's what this is right here, some closed surface, the electric flux, which is the electric field, uh, the flux of electric field over that surface. It's related to the total charge inside of that surface. And then I have Gauss's law for magnetism, which says the same thing, except that there's no magnetic charge, so that's equal to zero. So the magnetic flux over some closed surface is equal to zero. And that's what that closed surface means. These are surface integral, surface integral, and it's over a closed surface. And <clears throat> that's Gauss's law for magnetism. This is Faraday's law. This says that if I integrate a path integral of electric field over some closed path, that's a closed, closed again, and that's a path integral because I'm integrating dr. That's the area integral I'm integrating dA. So the path integral of E dot dr is, proportion, is related to the time derivative of the magnetic flux. This is not a closed surface, right? This is a surface bound by that path. So if you change the magnetic field with time, then you get a curly electric field. That's what that says. And then finally, this is the Ampere-Maxwell law. This says if I do the same thing with a magnetic field, <clears throat> B dot D, dr around some closed path, then there are two things that could create a magnetic field. One is an electric current, mu naught I in, so it's I passing through that surface bounded by that. And this is <clears throat> a time rate of change of the electric flux. Okay. Now, <clears throat> those aren't super useful. Um, in this case, what we want to do is to use uh, basically Stokes theorem and the divergence theorem. If we do that, we can actually change these uh, <clears throat> integral forms into a differential form. And I'm not going to go over that derivation right now. I do have a video on that. But we can write down that marker is kind of like dying on me. I thought it was good. I thought it was a good marker. Uh, <clears throat> we can write the following equations for Maxwell's equations. Wait, did I write? Yeah, here it is. Okay, so it's like this. Gauss's law becomes this. Uh, the divergence of the electric field E is equal to rho over epsilon naught. And rho is the charge density. But the nice thing about this compared to that, this is for some set surface, and this is just for all space. And even if charge density changes, then the divergence changes. Uh, Gauss's law for magnetism is pretty easy. It looks like this. 
uh, del dot b equals zero because there is no magnetic charge in C. Uh, <clears throat> Faraday's law looks like this. The curl of E del cross E is negative the partial with respect to T of the magnetic field. It's the same thing. And then finally we have uh, the Ampere-Maxwell law. De the curl of B del cross B is equal to mu naught j plus mu naught epsilon naught the partial of E with respect to T. So this j is the current density. It's the current per unit area. So if I have some current density in space. So these are Maxwell's equations in differential form. Okay, so what we want to do now is to use these and I want to get the wave equation from that. So let's start with um, <clears throat> rewriting these. I'm going to say, suppose that I have Maxwell's equations in free space. So free space means there's no electric charges and there's, so the charge into zero and there's no electric currents. So then I have uh, del dot E equals zero, del dot B equals zero, del cross E equals, let's see, that would be negative the partial of B with respect to T and del cross B equals uh, mu naught epsilon naught the partial with respect to T of E, free space. So there's no current, no charge in C. Now let's take this right here. Here I have a, a, a space relation for E and a time relation for B. And so I want to get both of these in terms of the electric field. So the, the answer here is to take the curl of both sides. So if I take the curl of the left side, I get the curl of the curl of E equals, I'll bring the negative sign out front, negative the curl of the partial of B with respect to T. Okay, let's deal with this right-hand side first. So the partial with respect to T says I'm only going to deal with time. And this says I'm only going to deal with space. So since this is only a space derivative, that's only a time derivative, I can change the order. So let's make this as negative the partial with respect to T of the curl of B. And then up here I can say, well, the curl of B is that. So I'm going to get negative mu naught epsilon naught uh, the partial with respect to T of the partial with respect to T of E. And so I just have two partials. I can just write this as negative mu naught epsilon naught the second partial of E with respect to time. So now we have our time. That's good. But over here I have the curl of a curl. I have to deal with this. Well, there is a vector identity. If I take this in general, I can say the curl of a curl of some vector field f is equal to the divergence, let's see it's del operated on the divergence del dot f minus the Laplacian del squared f. So if I use that for e up here, this side becomes uh, del del dot e minus del squared e. But del dot e in free space is zero. So this term is zero. So I get this is equal to, putting that over here, negative mu naught epsilon naught second partial of e with respect to t. And the negatives cancel. Now, we, we wrote, re, let me re remind you of our wave equation. Uh, second partial of f with respect to t equals v squared del f. So if I want to get in that form, then I need to uh, divide both sides by this, and I get the second partial of e with respect to t is equal to 1 over mu naught epsilon naught del squared Laplacian of e. And that's in the wave equation form. And more importantly, uh, v squared equals 1 over mu naught epsilon naught. And in fact, 
the speed of light c is equal to 1 over the square root of mu naught epsilon naught. So that is the speed of light. So we get the speed of light from that too. Well, what if I wanted to do this in, not with the electric field, but with the magnetic field? Well, let's, let's, it's going to be the very similar thing, right? Instead of starting with uh, the curl of E, let's start with the curl of B. So that's this. So I have, um, should I start on a new piece of paper? Let's start on a new paper here, just to make sure we have enough space. Okay, so I'm going to write down this. Del cross B is mu naught epsilon naught the partial of E with respect to T in free space. I'm going to take the curl of both sides, so I get the curl of the curl of B, and that's going to be equal to, I can pull this mu naught out front. Let's go ahead and pull the time out front too, because we already said that uh, space and time can be interchanged. So I get mu naught epsilon naught, the partial with respect to T of uh, the curl of E. And then the curl of E is negative, uh, the partial with respect to T. So it's going to be negative mu naught epsilon naught, the second partial with respect to time of B. Wait, yeah, right there. And then over here, I'm going to get uh, del del dot B minus the Laplacian of B equals this thing, negative mu naught epsilon naught, the second partial of B with respect to T. Uh, and then del dot B is zero. So I get, and then I divide both sides by this, I get the second partial of B, the vector, with respect to T, equals one over mu naught epsilon naught the Laplacian of B. The same thing, right? Same speed. So I have a I have an electric wave and I have a magnetic wave, and they both have the same speed, which would be kind of awkward if they didn't. Okay. Um, yeah, let's just stop there. But that shows you that from Maxwell's equations, we can get the wave equation. And it's super important, right? Maxwell's equations show that light is a wave an electromagnetic wave. The end.